I'll begin by introducing the panelists and just telling you a little bit about how I see this going. Uh, I've been describing it to these gentlemen as a cocktail party without the cocktails, sorry. Uh, it'll be a discussion and we'll of course want to bring you guys into it as well. We'll open up the floor for questions uh, a little ways into the discussion about galleries and what they can do for a city. And of course, we'll be discussing the situation in Vancouver. Uh, I'll start with, uh, let's do this in order. So Trevor Bodie on the end is one of the first people I met actually in Vancouver. Trevor took me on a little architecture tour of the city. It was great, it ended with scotch. <laughs> Alcohol seems to be the theme here. Uh, he's an architecture critic, uh, an architecture and urbanism historian. I wanna see your business card. And a consulting urban designer. He curated the 2008 exhibition Vancouverism, which was seen in London and Paris, and of course here in Vancouver during the Olympics, right? Yeah. Yes. Right here at Woodridge. Yeah. Right here. Fantastic. Yeah. And sitting next to Trevor is Grant Arnold. He is the O'Dane Curator of British Columbia Art at the Vancouver Art Gallery. Uh, his current show, which is uh, on for another week or so? Two weeks. Two weeks. Is one I really recommend. Uh, it's uh, my Fonway McLeod's uh, There and Back Again. It's... No, I didn't say that right, did I? M M Fonway McLeod or There and Back or, Again, yeah, right? That's, that's the name yeah, of the show, and it's great. Uh, other shows he's curated that you may have seen, um, Reese Terrace Odd Apartment, the Fred Herzog Show in 2007, Gareth Moore's show in Dialogue with Emily Carr, and uh, he co-curated Traffic, Conceptual Art in Canada, 1965 to 1980. Sitting next to Grant is Andrew Pask. Uh, he's the director of the Vancouver Public Spaces Network and he's a planner with the city of Vancouver. And uh, my first encounter with Andrew, really my only encounter before tonight, was seeing him speak about the Vancouver Art Gallery, gosh, I don't know how long ago, a couple of years ago during one of the public forums about it. And you had some really interesting things to say about whether it should move, etc. cetera. And uh, finally, Brent Totterin, who is sitting right next to me. He's, a, he's the former chief planner for the city of Vancouver and is now a city planning and urban design consultant running his own company, Totterin Urban Works, and he's always on Twitter, but he's taking a break right now. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I thought we should start by talking about the situation in Vancouver, what's happening with the Vancouver Art Gallery. So Grant, I'm going to give you the job of maybe summarizing where we are right now, because that'll give us a good place to start. So you're talking about the new building? Or? The new building, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, so the principal arch architects were hired recently, which is Herzog and Demiron. Uh, I think they're still in the process of figuring out who they're going to work with here. Um, and it'll probably be about uh, 18 months or so before there's kind of uh, drawings or other kinds of representations of what it might look like. Um, so there's is still a little ways off. The time frame in terms of it being completed is somewhere in the area of six years to seven years. And there's still some money that needs there's to be raised. There's a lot of money to be raised, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I should have brought a little collection box or something. <laughs> And for anyone who isn't aware, the, the current site of the Vancouver Art Gallery is sort of right downtown in a former courthouse, provincial courthouse, that was uh, renovated for the purpose of being an art gallery. The site that uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery is proposing uh, to move to and which the city has given uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery uh, with the uh, caveat that it has to raise this money is currently a parking lot right across the street from the Queen Elizabeth Theatre. So it's still downtown, but a little further east, not quite as central. Um, there was a lot of discussion a few years ago about whether the Vancouver Art Gallery even needed to move or whether it should stay put and expand. Uh, studies were done, lots of discussion was held. Uh, Trevor, I know that you had some, some thoughts about that. Have you changed? Well, it's, it's basically water under the bridge now. Um, I said when VAG made their decision, Selective Architect, they picked the best architect from the short list, and I think they're uh, tr truly an amazing firm and will, will do the, the issue and the site well. So I think that's a kind of non-issue anymore, what might have been. Uh, I do think, though, when it, the time is right, we need to talk about the politics of this whole commission and the nature of funding. And, and so on. I don't have any worries at the VAG end. I do worry about uh, federal government, et cetera, and other uh, 
forms of support. For well, the, the province has, well, the federal government has said outright, we don't have, we're not giving you the hundred million dollars that the city has said we're going, you need from us. And the province has really said, we're not giving you the other 50 million either. I'm sure there's a lot of concern about that at your workplace. Uh, no, I had a, a, the day of the announcement, I had a, a talk with Grant's boss, with Kathleen Bartels about this, and they've been very uh, clever, and I think, in not actually asking the federal government yet. There's not been a formal ask, and I think that's a really good idea under the current regime, because I think we know in advance what the answer will be. If you want a little background on this, there's a project in Ottawa for the National Portrait Gallery. This is a beautiful building on Parliament Hill, designed by Cram and Goodhue, wonderful art, uh, American architects in the 30s. It was the old U.S. Embassy. And so it's surplus property, it's historically listed, it's not being used for anything else. And they came up with a very nice scheme. Edward Jones, who did Mississauga City Hall and the National Portrait Gallery of England, uh, designed a scheme for it. And very, very early in the Stephen Harper government, it was ruthlessly destroyed, canceled, murdered, humiliated, shamed. Uh, I think that's when he sp first started mispronouncing it, arts, gila, you know. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the fix was in for major cultural building projects from that day on. So that was the difficult pre-shadowing of any su uh, sub subsequent asks. So I think it's very good that they're not asking. Unless you're the Museum of yeah. Human Rights in Winnipeg, that's a, yeah. that's a whole other <laughs> ball game. That was the previous game. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the uh, one of the discussions that's happened around the possibility of a new art gallery for the city is what a new art gallery could potentially do for the city, and I'm curious what all of you think actually. But I'll I'll start with you, Andrew. Do you think that building a new gallery in a different part of the city could actually have a, an impact that we, will be tangible on the way the city operates. A absolutely. I mean, as a, a major cultural landmark, it would certainly have the opportunity to activate a, a part of the city that right now, um, the Larwell Park site is a little bereft, shall we say. Uh, you've got Canada Post leaving there. You do have cultural facilities nearby, and this would actually certainly help to, to tie them together in that regard. I don't think um, your mic's working. Sorry, is my mic, is that That's better? better? Sorry about that, apologies. Did you guys hear what I said there? Okay, yeah. Um, I was just saying that yes, I, I do think the, um, the bag, if it, if it moves, has the capacity to do that, uh, to activate a, a part of the city that could certainly use that, uh, that type of contribution. I think the important thing that, um, that our organization, the Public Space Network, was trying to advocate for, and, and this is uh, the comments I was making a few years ago, is that right now the art gallery where it's located in, in the 800 uh, block of Robson uh, facing Georgia as well, plays a pretty important role there in terms of the public space and the public life of the city. And so um, at that point we said, you know, whether it stays or whether it moves, um, let's make sure that public space is a key part of the discussion. Uh, to their credit, uh, the um, councillors around the table have also said that that has to be an important part of the, uh, the discussion uh, with the Larwell Park site. And I don't know if you guys can see this or not, and I'm hesitant to turn my head to see if the image is up there, but one of the things that's really interesting about the, the new site of the art gallery is that in fact it was for many, many decades in the city a really uh, critical public space. Uh, the Canby Street grounds, it was formally renamed uh, Larwell Park in the 60s. Then it, um, it was leased as a bus depot, paved over, and now unfortunately has the indignity of being one of the biggest <laughs> flat surface parking lots. Um, we can certainly do better with that site, with the gallery there. We can also think about that in the context of Georgia Street, the Georgia Steps, the Vidux conversation. Uh, there's a lot of things that can happen with that. And sorry if I'm going in and out with the <laughs> microphone there. Do you guys think that the, the city tends to congregate at the Vancouver Art Gallery when something happens, when we win the gold medal in hockey or something like that, or we're angry about something we don't because we don't win the Stanley Cup? Uh, it seems to be a real uh, target for people to gather. Do you think that that building will still remain the target, being in the heart of the city, or with the construction of a Van new Vancouver Art Gallery that includes a public space, Will people migrate there, or is, it, is that a crazy question to ask so hypothetically at this point? What do you think, Ben? Well, I don't think the building is the reason people congregate there. The, the, the places, the spaces, and 
uh, there are actually a lot of weaknesses to Robson Square as a public place, and the fact that it succeeds despite those weaknesses shows how bereft we are of great public spaces in our downtown. And Andrew and I have had this talk many times, but so, I've never been concerned about the vague leaving uh, that building in that location. I think we, we, we had that debate like we have only one cultural offering, where will it be? And I've never perceived uh, our, our vision to be like that. We need to be thinking six chess moves ahead in terms of multiple facilities. Uh, the key is to make sure that that building stays as a cultural and civic facility when the bag leaves. And I've, I've been not shy with my hope that the, the, the absolutely fantastic Museum of Vancouver will immediately occupy that space because talk about a cultural organization that punches above its weight with a terrible site and a terrible building. And yet they do fantastic things in that, in that location. What could they do in a great civic space? I actually think they might do better uh, from a civic strengthening perspective than the VAG has done. No disrespect to VAG. But that's how much I respect the creativity that, that uh, MOV has shown. Uh, we're having this great discussion about how to ha create more public spaces to activate Robson Square, close it down to traffic. Uh, the big challenges, the bus movements. So all of that is going to be the answer to the question, is that still the gathering space? I think it is. Uh, n not necessarily because there isn't better, well, probably because there isn't better opportunities. Uh, oh. But can I, can I just yep. make a point about, um, about the, the new location? I'm sorry if this thing is falling off my ear. I'm, I'm going to be a bit provocative in debate, maybe with my friend Andrew, because uh, I think the problem we have with funding the VAG is more than just the ideology of the current government. I think we've got a fundamental argument problem with making the case for why any government of any stripe should fund the VAG. And the reason I say that is, uh, in my experience looking at how cities have used cultural facilities as catalysts for various things all over the world, uh, I have concluded that Cities, there's two types of cities that fund galleries. Uh, cities that have a ton of money, which we're not. Abu Dhabi's in that category. And cities that are desperate, which we're not. Uh, cities that are desperately trying to chase the Bilbao effect, want to have tourism, want to create something from nothing, and are, wi and are willing to gamble on a gallery and a huge amount of public money that goes into galleries to try to make something happen when nothing is currently happening. Our problem in Vancouver is we're successful. As a matter of fact, we're already a global city on the global with global attention, with high tourism, et cetera, and we're facing the, the pressures and challenges and heat of that kind of world attention already. So we don't have the, we can't make the case as a city that we're desperate. It's a bit of a weird way of putting it, but uh, success is a bit of a weakness for us in that case. And the Larwell Park site, the only thing that needs activity in that area is the Larwell Park site. And from my uh, knowledge of the land economics that in, in that area, it could develop tomorrow if we allowed it develop, to develop for what the market would want to develop it for. And it will be developed with an it office will. tower. And as a matter of fact, in most cities, the, the gallery is the initial catalyst. In our case, the cultural precinct, which we've been planning at in that area for years, ironically, the gallery may be the last piece of the puzzle, because we've got the post office site redeveloping, CBC's reinvested in their building, uh, the city has reinvested in the Queenie Theater. We've, we've got the puzzle pieces coming in. The Larwell Park's gonna be the last site, probably because of the question mark of this catalyst uh, of, of the gallery. But that's a very hard position to be in when you're going to the government to say, we have to fund this thing or nothing will happen. The truth is, things are gonna happen anyway. Um, uh, Trevor's here. trying to say something, but I just yeah. when, when you after you're finished, we have to talk about the art itself because right. that's really the and whole the point. Artists. And the yeah. artist, okay, go um, ahead, Trevor. We're here at the good graces of the Liter Literary Review of Canada, so I think it's good to do a couple humanist historians' footnotes on this. Uh, for one thing, I think I largely agree with what Brent says, although by that analysis, Toronto was desperate. Self-deprecating. Um, in, in the, in the uh, 1990s, when a far right-wing government, as far right as Harper, if not more so, the Harris Conservatives, with a finance minister by the name of Flaherty, put together a, a, a multi-billion dollar fund called Superbuild. So the extensions to the Royal Ontario Museum, Royal Art Gallery of Ontario, et cetera, et cetera, the were funded Opera by... The House. Exactly. Uh, by a very, very right-wing government 
uh, at a time when the city was dragging in recession, actually the beginnings of what is a structural crisis in Ontario was beginning then, and they thought they could... Uh, it made sense even to a far right-wing government to build lavishly for the arts. So that's uh, historic footnote one. Historic and it was split with the federal government. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And uh, historic footnote two is the reason why we have protests at the Vancouver Art Gallery is history. That was the provincial courthouse. That was the biggest and boldest provincial building in the city. In Canadian life, the provincial government controls so many sectors, so many more parts of our life than provincial or municipal. If you had a protest, you would take it to the biggest symbol of the provincial government in the city, i.e. the courthouse. And it's very interesting. We have a collective memory, you know, as a city and as citizens. And citizens, of course, it made sense to go there. And if, if it's turned into the biggest branch of the Bank of Montreal, there will still be protests there <laughs> because of the memory of citizens. Grant, the issue that we have not discussed is the reason for the need for a new art gallery, and that is the art. The, the current space is just woefully insufficient. Is yeah, it not? Actually, maybe I'd start by saying that um, the Guggenheim and Bill Bell is what I hope the VAG doesn't do. Um, it's a building where maybe people will go to see it. You hear nothing about the programming that takes place there. I've never seen anything in terms of their exhibitions where I've thought, well, I have to make a trip to Bilbao to see it. Um, so, um, I, and I fully admit, in terms of urban space and architecture, I'm nowhere near as knowledgeable as the other people up here. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of the inadequacy of the current building, there's been a lot of discussion about how uh, we really have no spaces to have uh, semi-permanent installations of the collection. We have a collection that has... Um, close to 11,000 pieces. Um, uh, you know, we can only show X number at any given time. We do lend them out, but nonetheless, it's a fairly glaring uh, inadequacy. We're, we're the only uh, institution of, uh, in Canada of that size that doesn't have that sort of space. But what's also more pressing right now is all the behind-the-scenes areas are just totally, totally overdone, um, to the point where it's actually physically dangerous at times because of the way the crates are stored and that sort of thing. So. Um, you know, most people are probably aren't aware of the kind of uh, demands that there are involving handling art, shipping art, bringing it in, framing it, preparing it to be exhibited, and um, there's, a, that's, there's a real immediate serious problem with that at the moment. I think my favorite uh, fun fact, or maybe not, that came out of one of those public sessions was someone explaining that the vaults where the art is kept often smell like marijuana because <laughs> people sit on the steps of the art gallery smoking pot well, it doesn't. all day yeah. long. Uh, and there's worse things you can smell sometimes, though, too. So, uh, um, yeah, you know, sometimes when you go into the basement and everybody seems happy, you wonder if... It must be a legalized pot demonstration or something outside the building. Yeah, I mean, there's other problems as well in terms of the way... Um, <clears throat> in an art museum, uh, you have to keep uh, extended records of uh, the humidity and temperature in your exhibition spaces. Um, and you'll see sometimes these weird little boxes, and that's what they're doing. The reason for that is that uh, if you want to borrow you know, work from another museum, you have to provide them with those records and do a facilities report. So if we want to borrow whatever, um, a Dutch painting from the Rijksmuseum, we have to send them uh, the records that we have for the period of, same period of the year the exhibition will be on. So if it's in the summer, we have to send them their records, our records from the past summer. Um, and uh, when the initial renovation was being done, there were some shifts that were made to the way the cooling system works. So we actually get our water coming in from Robson Square. And uh, in the summer, it's not at the right temperature to keep our uh, environment at, the, in, at uh, the levels of humidity and temperature where they're supposed to be. So all of that's kind of dry. But so what another, do you do? Um, we have dehumidifiers uh, in place in the middle of the gallery. So you'll see these large metal objects that make a lot of noise. Um, and even that's not um, um, optimal. Uh, the building actually, it, it, I, we can't really run too many more people a year through the building than we're getting now. It's kind of, especially in the summers, I mean, it, uh, it's kind of elbow to elbow looking at some of the exhibitions. So um, in terms of growing attendance, the, the facility actually places a bit of a limit on that now. But given the challenges that you just outlined, Brent, in terms of funding, how is this art gallery going to get built? Well, 
I, I think it is important to, I, you know, I've asked myself, is there even a point to having the incredibly important discussion about the design of this building uh, in the shadow of this huge funding question? And the answer is yes, we should, uh, because things can change and, and a case can be made. Uh, and the fact that something is hard doesn't make, uh, make it uh, impossible, but it kind of does feel like we're, we're having a coffee table discussion about what we would do if we won a million dollars. It's all a big hypothetical that we can enjoy, but... but in Vancouver, we'd buy a or, bungalow uh, in East Van. <laughs> if that, right? But uh, everything I said is, is, is I I'm say as a point about how hard this funding challenge is going to be, and I think we need to go into that with our eyes open. And it's not as simple as many people probably think as, well, in the next election, the regime may change. My perspective is it's still going to be a tough discussion no matter who is in the federal government and who is in the provincial government. Uh, having said that, I have no problem saying as a city builder that, um, that it is a good investment for cities to invest in culture, both in small culture and big culture in terms of big cultural objects and infrastructure within the city. There's a proven, when you do it smartly, and there's some cities that haven't, but when you do it smartly, there is a proven cultural multiplier in terms of spin-off, private sector investment, et cetera. One of our challenges is how you make that case that that private sector investment wouldn't happen anyway. But even in our city, thing, it, it generates revenue. It's a, it, it can be perceived as a strategic investment rather than just a cost, which is why Toronto did it. And that was a great point, Trevor. Uh, you know, some very good examples can be learned from, from how Toronto uh, has been doing things over the last while. But I think we have to make the case that this, the, uh, the fi a financial case about uh, what this can do in terms of this multiplier and spin off effect. Uh, and that's not going to be easy, but it is something that's possible. That whole part of the city could just completely transform, not only with the art gallery, the viaducts are going to come down. I think we know that. Uh, and this whole, I, I don't know, what's, do we know what's happening with the post office? We don't, actually. It's, do it's been sold, and yeah. it's, being, it, it's, it's going to be redeveloped. Into what? Uh, I, I know more than I can tell. Oh. <laughs> but, now uh, I really wish I had a cocktail. Tickle him. But of course, <laughs> but, but this is the point. It's, that whole area is going to transform anyway. Uh, I was on CBC talking about the, the, the VAG, and, and Stephen Quinn asked me, you know, how does this relate to the, the, the question of removing the viaducts? And I said, honestly, it doesn't. Uh, it, it's a separate question. The two can be synergistic, but neither is dependent on each other. That whole area is going to transform no matter what happens to the VAG. And I say that as a supporter, a, I want to be clear, a strong supporter of using that site for the new VAG and, and finding funding sources for it. But we can't make the case that it's called the but-for argument. But for this investment, this area would not happen. We can't make that case because it'll happen anyway. That's the truth of it. Can we talk about other cities that, oh, Grant, did you want to say something? Um, well, the one thing I was going to say that, I mean, obviously the cost of uh, producing a new building uh, will be front and center, but uh, the other funding question that's tied into that is where the operating funds are going to come from. Um, uh, there we have sort of all sorts of plans, you know, including an endowed position for a curator of Asian art and that sort of thing. Um, but operating money has been a kind of real, uh, and how to grow it is a, is a dilemma. And the AGO, I mean, when it, they op reopened from their last renovation, you know, and this is a fairly consistent pattern with a number of art museums, you know, three months later they announced they're laying off 40 people because they didn't meet their revenue projections. And I think that that's uh, a problem with a lot of institutions is coming up with realistic revenue projections. Um, in a, uh, I worked at two places before I came to work at the VAG, the Mental Art Grand Saskatoon and the Art Gallery of Windsor. Uh, they didn't charge admission, so the VAG was like the first place I worked where g gate revenue basically becomes a factor in the budget. Um, when I first started working at the VAG, uh, which was in uh, the mid-90s, 80% uh, of the operating budget would have come from different levels of government. Now it's less than 30. Um, and so uh, in, I think... And one of the plans will be, but and I think it'll be very important for this to actually take place, is that uh, in addition to raising money for the building, there'll have to be some kind of endowment to produce operating money. Um, you know, be, uh, it's unrealistic, I think, to expect that there'll be large increases in operating money. Uh, hopefully, there will be some, but it's not certainly not sufficient. And then there's it, also it, the collection. That's the other yeah, question. Yeah, the, the you know the art market has gone totally insane in the last 20 years. Um, uh, 
the, the VAG is a little bit unusual in terms of Canadian art museums in that it had an, has an endowment to provide funds for acquisitions, which came from uh, when the old building on Georgia Street, site, when that site was sold for more money than anticipated, some of it went into producing endowment. And when I first started working at the VAG, I was producing around $400,000 a year, um, and which was a fairly decent budget at that time. Um, but that's when interest rates are high. You know, uh, in fact, at certain points in the recent past, uh, not only has it not generated any income, but the principal has shrunk. Uh, but aside from that, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, contemporary art now regularly sells for uh, more than a million dollars. There's artists based in Vancouver whose work sells for that. Um, Stan Douglas's piece here, um, I, I don't know what the actual value was, but it would be in that area. So to, to maintain a kind of, or to build a collection of, even of important artists in this area, the, the gallery um, at the moment doesn't have the money to do that. I just want to kick this money thing around a bit. Um, I support the new gallery, and I think it's a really good use of both public and private funds, so we should do that. Otherwise, by the standards of other Canadian cities, we're not that bad off, okay? We've had an unusual situation in Vancouver of having bonus densities, public amenities, CACs, et cetera. We've had a stream of funding that other cities would dream about that have created things like the Contemporary Art Gallery, the uh, International Film Center, uh, the Dance Center to some degree, the Roundhouse, et cetera. Um, you know, Edmonton and Calgary don't have those spaces. And they would love to have them well, for their Edmonton art. has a beautiful They have a new gallery. art gallery, but they don't have the next layer down, nor That's does right. Calgary. Calgary's got one private, Esker, et cetera. So we have, to some degrees, harvested uh, from the private sector, from the development industry, and made a middle range of, of institutions, and good on us, and we should continue to do so. Where we've utterly failed is in funding artists. And I think we cannot talk about bricks and mortar without talking about that. We have the lowest uh, uh, rates of support to, for the creation of art, all forms of art, visual, literary, stage art, in the country. And it's a structural issue that has persisted in British Columbia, no matter if it's an NDP or a liberal Socrat government. We have structurally decided it is not worthwhile to put money into the creation of art. And to me, that's what's so lacking here. And in this ultra ex expensive city, to have such paltry funds available to artists shames me. And I've seen my, my friends from Eastern Canada move here, try wanting to work here, et cetera, then going back. Because especially if you're mid-career or at certain stages, that it, it's not on. So I, I do think that sometimes, and we're guilty of the architect city builders that we are, uh, obsessing about the bricks and mortar side of it, but I really think we need to have a big debate about funding the arts. Well, even uh, breaking up the bricks and mortar discussion, the first year that I arrived in Vancouver, 2006, at City Hall, um, I was involved with what was called the Creative City Plan at the time, the Arts and Culture Plan for the city, and the corresponding uh, Cultural Facilities Master Plan. And there was a very deliberate strategic decision to focus on, uh, the metaphor was the part of the iceberg underneath the water. And deliberately, I don't know if reject is too strong a word, but we weren't going to be distracted by the shiny object at the top of the water because a real cultural infrastructure is about all that production space, the back of house, the production space for performance, production space for uh, 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 all kinds of uh, produced art. Uh, and we were seen as weak on that. I don't know uh, much about the funding of the artists, so I can't challenge uh, Trevor on his uh, comments. But I do know that the focus at the time, to the detriment of things like a new vague, was that we, we were deliberately rejecting that notion. And, and uh, Vancouver at the time was looking at other cities and seeing how they were blowing their budgets on the big shiny object with no supporting cultural infrastructure underneath to support local art, et cetera. And so a lot of what we've been doing uh, in the bricks and mortar in Vancouver has been about using tools, everything from capital budgets to density bonusing, which is a frequent tool used to facilitate the arts, uh, to provide that back of house uh, production space that doesn't even have a sign out front, but art is being produced in there, either performance art or visual art. And you know, one of the biggest issues that sort of is about supporting artists is artist housing. And we've done a lot. A lot uh, is a relative term, but there's been a lot of effort put into things like artist live work facilities, H housing essentially for artists. 
Um, so a lot of the energy has gone into that, probably to the detriment of funding artists directly, also ironically to the detriment of the big art moves. I had come from Calgary uh, previously where the, 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 the whole focus of the cultural discussion was about, I called it the where's the Smithsonian debate because Cal someone, some big oil person in, in Calgary had decided that Calgary should have a Smithsonian. And so the whole public discussion or, or cultural discussion was where can we put the Smithsonian? So when I came to Vancouver, I was impressed by the sophistication of the discussion about how you build a cultural infrastructure. But I have to say, even then, I, I was new, so I didn't necessarily push this much, but I was a bit of someone who said, well, I do believe we still need to think about the big cultural offerings, the culture houses, the things that are at the top of the iceberg, and how we pay for those too. And Calgary is an interesting uh, model because right now, a group that wants to build a contemporary art museum has been granted favored status for the old planetarium, mm. which would be, I think, mm. very cool use of space. That yeah, would be. Can, can I just add on, build on what Brent was saying? I mean, yeah. coming coming from Toronto, we, we didn't have the um, the the um, same notion of trying to land a particular gallery, but we did have a chasing Frank Gehry discussion that went on for an awfully long time. Um, and I don't know that I would say Toronto was necessarily a, a, uh, a city that was desperate, but it certainly did have moments of pretty profound self-deprecation uh, where they, you know, the hands were wrung about why we didn't have that sort of grand structure and, and how could we get Toronto's favorite architectural son to come home and do something. And then, of course, Daniel Libskin landed onto the scene as well. We could talk about the ROM in, in the context of that. And that the ROM sort of, was one of those Superbuild projects, it, it, too. It, it was. But, you know, the, you know, part of the discussion there that's quite interesting that I think actually reflects on the Vancouver situation is that you do have the opportunities for these uh, bigger buildings, whether it's through um, policies from the Harris government or other governments. But you also have a, a sort of a, an array of um, other socioeconomic considerations that actually do support some of the under the water iceberg components. There is an opportunity for affordable um, spaces in Toronto, relative again, uh, that you simply don't find in Vancouver and there is a desperation in the art scene here to try and make that happen. Um, you know, we are looking at, wearing my city hat, we are looking at, at ways to you know, tweak the zoning um, uh, bylaw within industrial areas to try and make more uh, studio spaces, more maker space to allow more uh, events to take place. Uh, perhaps not consistently, but more uh, ephemeral events, one or two or three nights a, a month. And that's helping a little bit, but then you look at the size of the studios that are being created or their location or things like that, and you realize that the challenge is still very much there, uh, and we're still trying to do, do battle with that in, in a significant way. So the, the landscape in other cities, whether it's Winnipeg or Toronto, um, it does have a little bit more breadth in that regard that I think uh, enables um, the artistic production side there as well. And, and that's a really good point. But I have to say, if I'm a tourist coming to Vancouver and I go to the art gallery and I can't see a Jeff Wall and I might not be able to see an Emily Carr, that's going to be really frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I, I also think it's probably pretty frustrating that you look at Saskatoon and all of a sudden they're getting their shiny new art gallery. Toronto has a beautiful facility. I, I love the renovated AGO. And I, I, you know, as someone who really cares about visual art, I find it frustrating uh, that there isn't that space uh, in Vancouver. I understand it's, it's pretty complex. All of these things are very important, but this is a city that really is on the international map in terms of some of the artists who have come from here and who still live and work here. And yet we've got this very small gallery Well, space. it's just as bad or even worse than Calgary, which is a richer city. And they've never had a VAG. They've had a Glenbow History Museum that's done the odd show, and they've got a private Esker Foundation. I think, the, I think we have to scare this out as intellectuals, again, because of our sponsors. I think we live in a Western Canadian resource economy that is hugely underestimating the importance of creativity in the arts and humanities to its economic survival. And I think this is more than a Richard Florida argument that we need, you know, creative sipping coffee. We actually, for my field, architecture, visual arts are the R&D department. Most of us architects are deeply interested and active and passionate consumers of visual art. Because it's good for us, it's good for our soul, yes. But it's also where 
we can see visual ideas and notions and notions of media and materiality, et cetera, explored. So in other words, it's giving back to, to people in my industry, to the development and architectural industry. There are people out there creating things that will have an impact and make things better. They're creating economic value. Um, just a little, it, I, this is not meant to be a commercial, but we, we, we listed, <laughs> it is, we listed the 130 people involved in making this not unbu as yet unbuilt tower in Vancouver that's in my exhibition. Of the 130, about 20 or 25 have degrees in fine arts. They have wandered in and used their creative schools, skills as designers and graphic designers and makers, et cetera. Uh, they are crucial to a major money-making industry in the city. I guess back to my original point is that unless we take care of them, not just train them, Emily Carr is great, but there's that crucial period outside of school. Where do they live? Where do they work? Where do they get going? And to me, that is the most crucial sector. And we're running away chasing a, a liquefied gas industry that's probably... Australians are seven years ahead of us on this, et cetera. We, we're still Western Canadian resource producers looking for the next resources boom that will prop up our lifestyle. And we're not seeing the creative minds that really run our economy. Can I ask a question of the audience? Can you raise your hand if you consider yourself to be in some way here tonight because you're part of the cultural sector? Well, and, well. and raise your hand if you self-identify as part of the business sector. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, the architects and the cultural sector will not convince any government of the power of that multiplier effect, even if it's true, which it is. Uh, I think the real opportunity we have both, I, I saw this in Calgary, uh, the, the Texas cities are spending massive amounts of money because the oil families are all dying and they want to have a legacy. So they're putting a huge amount of money into culture because it's instant respect. And this is why cities like Austin and Houston and Dallas and such are having these, uh, some better than others, cultural renaissance. And I've always perceived that Calgary will be the Canadian city that sees that. So they may not be as far along as us, but they're going to pass us fast as soon as that money starts to flow. It's now, taking longer than I would have thought, I actually. thought so, too. Uh, I, I thought it would have happened by now, but I'm still convinced it's going to happen. In Vancouver, it's real estate money. It's the Michael Audains. It's the And that opportunity is still there, but we have to make it a discussion about how not how culture stimulates the architectural community, because I'm not sure the rest of the world cares. But uh, if, it, if it stimulates the business community, the idea of, in New York City, business people go to the Met for lunch, at lunch. You know, there's a, there's an, you don't have to convince the business community in, in New York right, about the assets. you're talking circles, because architects are business people, and developers, my examples, were both business-oriented, so you've contradicted yourself. Well, and I don't mind yeah. contradicting myself, yeah. because the business community doesn't perceive architects as one of That's, them. It's a problem for us in the media, and indeed intellectuals, because we're not connecting those dots. Yeah, I agree. We need to do that. I mean, you know anyway, what I mean? And uh, us in this room, we need to brag a little bit more and talk my, about that. My point that. is, regardless, we all know architects and city planners. I'm a, I'm a business person, too. But, but, but that's not, it, it can't be the, the so-called design intellectuals that are leading this charge for us to succeed, uh, especially with conservative governments in power. I think it needs to be a, a, a discussion about how arts and culture contribute to economic development. It, indeed, it's a leg, it's a platform of economic development, and it's not just Richard Florida, but it is talent retention and recruitment, it is uh, uh, economic development, it's tourism, it's quality of life, which is a stimulator of economic uh, success. There's a very strong business case to be made for it. That's true, which I always find very depressing. Why can't we just love art for art's sake? But I know that we do need that. We do need that. Uh, we do have to open up the uh, floor to questions, and I do implore you to ask questions. Uh, it would be interesting to know what you think, but really hoping that you, in making your comments, could include something that ends with a question mark uh, for one of the <laughs> panelists or all of the panelists. So if you just put your hand up, uh, handsome Nick there uh, will bring the microphone, uh, roving microphone Nick will bring you the microphone, as he's doing right now. Okay, I'm a little nervous public speaking, but uh, here's the question. and. Uh, with, with respect to the Vancouver Art Gallery, um, they're in a, a magnificent uh, location and it makes good business sense. You speak about business with hotels and the retail and uh, just being in the heart of the city. And my 
question to you is given a choice between starting with a new building or expanding and renovating um, Robson Square, I think they both have merit. And I just wanted to ask uh, the panel what their thoughts would be on either an expansion of the art gallery where it is, allowing the Robson Square to realize its full potential, which it really hasn't, as opposed to a new building being designed by somebody outside the country. As Well, Trevor, as you said, the sh that ship has sailed, although you were one of the people who argued that expansion was possible and exciting at the time. Well, th there was a very good study by a Los Angeles architect, Michael Meltzen, who investigated how and where the VAG could extend on its own site. Um, some of those had potential, but again, that, that's water in the bridge. I think the real opportunity was lost when VAG did not speak firmly enough when Robson Square was available. UBC should never have moved into that space. That's been a calamitous mistake. Um, uh, because there they had a theater, and, but pushing to the, uh, going to the other side of the road, it said, I know it had problems, it's not an ideal gallery space, but it would have given a one location magnificent plant in the best place in town if we'd handled it right. It was just a bozo decision about, a, it's not big enough for UBC, they're pushing at the seam, they don't like it. Uh, and we lost that opportunity. I hate to say it though, Andrew, I think the same thing's happening again with the public space in front of the gallery. <laughs> and I know your organization has organized competitions there and they were great, I supported them. How, and Grant has indicated there's a huge problem with the storage vaults mm -hmm. for the VAG. Yeah. So I, I worry that we're, we're, we're making a temporary solution. VAG needs storage until it moves for six to seven years. And we have a hugely underfunded public space project. Maybe you can, uh, Grant, you could tell what's, what's going to happen in front of the gallery. Yeah, I, well, it's to get back to the question. There, yeah. there, as um, Trevor mentioned, and actually uh, when UBC was going in there back in the late 90s, there was actually another large internal study done uh, that came up with possibilities for underground renovation. And uh, I don't know exactly what level the talks got to, but there certainly was discussions with the city. Um, and it, and it, it, it wasn't basically feasible, I think, for a variety of reasons. Part, I mean, I, I, I'm not a contractor, so I, when someone tells me that it costs more money to renovate a building like that than it does to build a new one, I'm not really in a position to argue with it. Um, but it is a very, very uh, uh, complicated site to build on. Um, and the, it, these, these discussions have been going on for, what, 15 years or more? And so... There have been at least two points in time when it was very seriously looked at expanding on that site. And there were so many complications. The Michael Maltzen uh, project that Trevor just mentioned, where there was actually a model produced that wasn't about what the gallery would look like, but it, de it delineated the spaces that could be expanded into. And at that time, the city really uh, was opposed to, those, uh, to that happening. They felt that... Um, the, the three-block project, that, of which the gallery is the, the north end of, which was so crucial to, to making Vancouver into what it is now, uh, they didn't want it to be messed with that much. So uh, there, was, there were, was a very serious look uh, taken at, at staying on that site. And I mean, I, it's, I love the site. I, I actually don't like the building, but I like, I like the site for precisely some of the reasons that have been discussed here. Um, it's great that there's demonstrations that go on out front. I always like it when I hear on the radio that this is happening and it's at the art gallery, even if it has nothing to do with art. Um, but it, uh, but uh, you know, it has been looked at very seriously and seems like it's not that viable to, to stay there. There could be some expansion, even if it's not an art gallery expansion there, because one of the fun uh, ideas that was floated after the Vancouver Art Gallery received the approval from the city to, to get the land to move was the idea of building an underground concert hall that it was Bing Tom. Uh, I mean, I don't know that that would ever happen. I think it would be really cool. The city actually could really use yeah. a... What the gallery it? actually does spread out there is a lot of stuff built out underground beyond uh, the building now. And uh, when you're in the vault, actually, in the summer, you can usually tell what the weather's like because if it's sunny, you can hear the skateboarders going back and forth <laughs> over top of you, and if it's raining, they're not there. Uh, so it does go out beyond the boundaries of the building quite a bit. Andrew? I was going to say that, that um, I think to the question there, you know, the, the thing that is key to me is the idea of cultural purpose in that, in that building, and I agree wholeheartedly with what Brent was saying earlier about the... Uh, the possibility of 
the museum moving because they would they would make fantastic tenants there. The Bing Tom idea that was floated a few years ago was actually an interesting take on this because it was the idea of excavating the front uh, the front uh, North Plaza, the Centennial um, Square area, building a, a, a concert facility down below, but also using the, the museum building uh, as a, uh, housing a number of cultural tenants. So the idea is that that would be a mini cultural complex in its own right. Um, and the, the, the big question around the move, I mean, we've always said, you know, if it stays, uh, that's great. Let's make sure that public space is, is a prominent component. Ditto if it moves. Um, there are some interesting other possibilities that were, were discussed, Canada Post Building being one of them at uh, a certain point. And when you look at um, the architects that have, have now been retained, uh, uh, the Herzog and the uh, um, Miron, uh, they have done some wonderful refurbishing. The Tate Modern in London uh, was an old power plant. You could almost imagine them working on something like the Canada Post Building. Well, anyways, maybe that ship has sailed, but uh, there were a number of ideas that were floated somewhere in the order of about 19 different studies Kathleen Bartels mentioned at one point. All right, we have another question from the audience. Thank you. Um, well, my personal perception is that Vancouver is a city flush with creativity and artistic endeavors, but I'm afraid for me that's less because of the VAG than it is of many struggling artistic communities that you know, I'm familiar with. My question would be, what role do you see the gallery actually playing in terms of leadership in assisting the little guy? That's a good question for you, Grant. Um, well, uh, actually, if you look at institutions that are similar size to the VAG across the country, like, like the AGO or the Musée de Beaux-Arts, um, we actually have a fairly large component of our programming as artists who live here. Uh, we actually have fairly specific uh, programs that are targeted at, quote, emerging artists. It's kind of a term that I hate, uh, which include Michael Adain, as a, for example, endowed a fund that's specifically for the purchase of works by, um, by, by younger artists, by emerging artists, um, for the collection. Um, I mean, there's lots to criticize about the VAG, but I think it actually has done reasonably well in terms of exhibitions that have had uh, not only Jeff Wall in them, but uh, much younger artists. Uh, so I, that's always a kind of debate around um, museums is how much local content there is. Um, but again, I, there have been a kind of number of projects that, you, that are on, uh, and ongoing that um, do be, provide a venue for, um, for artists at different stages in their career to um, make their work available to a, to a broader public. And maybe with um, more space, would there be more of that? Or yeah, really? that would be the idea of it. I, I think a kind of larger question um, is, is how the gallery um, addresses the shifting demographics in the city new kinds of audiences, for, um, um, or developing audiences from uh, communities that are, you know, have different, I hate the term, ethnic backgrounds, and, and or who, are, who are coming from different cultural perspectives. Um, we've made some progress that way. Um, for example, the, gal you know, the gallery has made um, Asia Pacific, activity in the Asia Pacific, an important part of its programming, uh, but we've only finally got a curator who can speak a language other than English, who speaks Mandarin. Uh, within the last year. Um, so there's different, uh, I kind of not coming to a nice conclusion, but um, that's, you know, I, I think that in terms of the gallery's engagement with the local community, in terms of the number of things we do, it's, I think it's reasonably good for the size of the institution. Again, it's something we'd want to do more of. There have been things that have been important um, uh, related to some of the uh, uh, conditions around development have been talked about. So, for example, that we have an off-site space now on Georgia Street, um, uh, which is, uh, we've had projects by artists from outside Canada, but also a number of local artists as well. And, that, and, and that's something that um, we could certainly think about, is how also to do things outside the building. And, Andrew, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was just, I, I think the question's a really important one, and it, it um, first of all, I think, that idea of the relationship between this institution and the the little guy, or, or, or um, uh, I think that should be pushed um, pretty profoundly. And it strikes me that the conversation um, really, I mean, it, it speaks to the changing nature of 
civic and cultural institutions, um, not just galleries, but museums, libraries are having that same conversation. Like, what's the interface um, between the public and, and the institute? Um, you know, libraries are now looking at ways where they can send librarians out into the community. The, the whole idea of that threshold between the building, the four walls and the outside world is something that gets um, looked at a lot. So, you know, you look at galleries now and, and more and more of them are starting to talk about things like maker space in the gallery, um, starting to think about um, guest curatorial. So that, that sort of porousness between the public or the artistic community, the local, the little guy, however you want to frame it, and the, the bigger institute, I think, is actually transforming itself, which is really quite cool. Um, and, and as I said, I mean, this is not something that's just around galleries. Uh, even our city hall in Vancouver is sending out mobile city halls uh, in, uh, in a month or something like that. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a transformation that's happening uh, in quite a lot of places. We should be encouraging that thinking here as well. God save us, a plague of mini halls? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 22 neighborhoods what? coming this to is, a corner This is a, a little to you. concerning. Uh, can I, can <laughs> yes, I go say? ahead, Brent. It's, it's reasonable to challenge uh, the vague, to, to have it in their mindset, to contribute to the little guy, although we have to recognize they have big operating and funding challenges. It's reasonable to challenge government to say we need to do more, but the government is ch trading off that kind of expenditure with you know, a, a transit referendum and a huge uh, challenge building transit, social housing, many other priorities that also have multiplier effects and are competing for finite funds. It's funny, we never seem to ask, can we afford roads? But we ask, can we afford galleries? Can we afford social housing? Can we afford transit? I never quite understand that mindset. But I, I have to, every time, I, every time in Vancouver, something is closing, and the truth is we are losing cultural assets quicker than we are building them. Every time something is announced that it's going to close, I get called by the media, and we do some sort of a, a conversation about it. And I always try to make the point that part of the story is always it's closing because it didn't get support. Not government support, people support. The numbers weren't there. And I think part of our question has to be why we as a population in Vancouver don't seem to be supporting arts and culture enough. You know, if the, if the theater is closing and becoming a church, like one of ours is, it's, the first thing they say is the numbers were really down. We weren't getting the, the, the bums in seats. And right. I think that's that got to be that, part of the you discussion. You need to invert your question because the issue is not the lack of support of the Hollywood cinema or bookstores, etc. It is our over-support and obsession with real estate to the point that we have become a one-industry city, and that industry is eating the city. In other words, it's an irrational self-interest mm -hmm. to not be so obsessed with real estate. Our media landscape, our political institutions are utterly shaped by real estate here. Well, that, that and I'm be, saying is this as, as someone who works and makes a living from it. Trevor, that and, and be if, true. if we only have one industry, there is no room for any values or any activity other than the highest and best use of real estate. So we've created a monster that we don't quite know how to stop. No, I, I don't buy that easy narrative. It's not it, easy. That, it's can, be, that can be both true and a too easy an excuse. We still are a city filled with people that want to have a cultural life, an entertainment life, etc. And yes, the, the, there is incredible pressure on every piece of square inch of our city, uh, but that doesn't explain why the numbers are down uh, in terms of actually supporting cultural um, opportunities within the city. I'm guessing a lot of families are like mine, where every cent goes to the mortgage and childcare. Uh, there's not a lot left over. Uh, yes, we've got a question from the audience. Uh, yeah, I'm a visual artist, but I would like to respond right away to, before I forget what I wanted to say, to uh, Mr. Uh, Brent Todrin. Brent Todrin. Thank you. Um, it's the media, well, what Trevor Bodie said too, it's the media that does not seem to be educating. It's an issue of education, I think. And we need that education to come from, generally speaking, the media. The Globe and Mail, I think, does the best job of any. I, I worked for the province for a while, mm -hmm. and the Sun, actually. And uh, I'm not in media anymore, but I can see that the role of education is not now being done by the media. What do you mean by education? Uh, well, at the province, or the Sun, they used to have Joan Lowndes writing about fine art. 
Um, there were some other people, like Max Wyman worked at the province when I was there. He was a dance critic, but still. You're talking about coverage of coverage, the arts. Coverage, coverage of the There's arts. There's no question arts coverage in this city, even in the six years that I've been here, whoa, has it ever declined. Okay, and my question to the panel is, uh, how do we get business involved in buying art from local artists? Because local artists are professionals, and they need to be supported in their creation of, of the art from the grassroots. And so how does the panel see that problem being addressed? That's my question. Thank you. Any thoughts? I'd just like to say that the media is also going through a rough time. That's why yeah. there's not a lot of money left over for <laughs> art reviews or anything else. Uh, Trevor, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, you know, the biggest single patron, ironically, of visual art in the city is the development industry by far. Yeah. The Where biggest, would we be without the, Michael The biggest O'Dane. collectors, O'Dane, uh, Gillespie, Bob Rennie, et cetera. Overwhelmingly, the people who are driving, we have, people may not know, but this is the most advanced and productive visual art city in the country by far. And only LA and New York come nearest to North America. There are more world-class artists here and, and, and more straight dollar values. You just look at the net value of work sold by Vancouver-based artists. We are in a class of ourselves. But, but it's younger and, and earlier careers that are particularly hurt by the lack of coverage. And it hurts. When I, I, you know, I've written for The Sun and written for The Globe, et cetera. I know there's 10 requests for every one that happens. It must be 50 to you, Marcia, now. Uh, for I people. have 867 unopened emails oh, right no, now. Okay. And See, they're uh, all no, asking it, me it, to write about something. And it's extremely hard because I think uh, Marcia's doing a, a terrific job, not since tri uh, Stephen Godfrey, if we had a, as hard a working uh, a cultural correspondent as she is. But having said that, it's the young career people not getting coverage and not being broken out, and, or even just having arguments about their work. That's where it hurts. And I think. <laughs> Online and uh, other modes have not really filled that gap yet. I don't know. We, uh, Michelle Smolkin is here from, um, who did a wonderful uh, documentary for Radio Canada uh, about the art spaces and arts in, in, in Vancouver. And I think very positively, she found the new niches, what she feels to be the new ways that artists are getting work done, et cetera. So when she gets to ask a question, maybe she'll t tell us about it. Yeah. Okay, we've got another question. I was really struck by your question, Brent, about how many of us here are in the cultural and arts community, how many are in the business community. I'm in neither. I'm just, I'm in the healthcare community. Yeah. And I really care very, very significantly about art in Vancouver, very pleased about the fact that we're, we, we, we hopefully will get a new art gallery. But it really speaks volumes to this issue that, that we were talking about just, just a, a little bit a while ago about leadership and the art gallery getting beyond the bricks and mortar and into the community so that the people, you know, that, 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 that people can understand the importance of it, but also so that uh, the art gallery is in the schools, it's in the community centers, it's, it's some of those ideas that you, you talked about, uh, you know, what, what the symphonies are doing and what the libraries are doing. I don't know how successful or what the plans are for the, for the art gallery to get into the community, but if the community doesn't support the arts, you know, people like me who, who have no vested interest except that I love it, you know, and realize how important it is, um, all these questions we're, we're never going to get around the bricks and mortar, you know, raising the money for bricks and mortar and raising the money for artists and all the things that we really should be doing. So I'm, I'm not satisfied that I've heard an answer to that question. I hope there is one. Um, I guess what I would say is that the gallery's public programs department has different levels and there are parts of uh, uh, programs department that are uh, geared very specifically at uh, post-secondary, not post-secondary, secondary and primary education. So, you know, programs are developed to take uh, kids of various ages um, and hopefully get them to think about and, and talk about and have fun uh, engaging with the work. Again, that, that's a program and the program costs money and uh, so uh, I think they actually do really well for the amount of money they have, but um, that's definitely, I think, something that's important. It's something that actually a lot of thought uh, is given to, um, but our, our public programs people are kind of to run off their feet at the moment. Um, again, they do actually engage with, they, they also do um, 
sort of longer projects, whether it be a, you know, groups of high school students, for example, who will produce something, for example, a documentary of some sort. Um, but again, you're, you're talking about um, maybe two or three of those things a year, and they involve 20 people each. So they're great in terms of the level of their engagement. They obviously could be um, more of it. I'm always a little bit worried about num- only in dealing with numbers. Um, I mean, the gallery has about 300,000 people through the year. Um, we, you know, uh, you can do things that'll boost your numbers, but I think what's crucial is the quality of the kind of engagement that's there, um, and that's how uh, you, you build audiences. Certainly, that's a philosophy that you have to get people being uh, finding the gallery to be an interesting place, not a place they go to out of duty, but because they go there um, because it makes them think, because it's fun, and that's something that has to start. Um, you don't start doing that with people who are 25. So. I, I'd just like to say the family fuse programming that you do is fantastic. If you have young children, it's a great way to get kids in there. And, if, and the fuse nights, which I guess you do four times a year, is that right? About? Those are great. Um, it's a great party on a Friday night. Highly recommended. Uh, we've got a question over here. Uh, I'm in the uh, business community, and uh, I have... Uh, uh, two comments with respect to what I've heard so far. Uh, uh, I've concluded that it's all about uh, money, and we'll talk about the little guy. The little guy being the artists, the mid-tier artists, who uh, have really not participated to any great extent in the Vancouver Art Gallery. But more importantly, the uh, question of raising money I would agree that the governments right now, at all levels, uh, are not jumping into this this, uh, required element, namely putting up money or suggesting they're going to put up money. I think they would like to see success at our level first, and then I would suggest later the governments would hopefully participate. Uh, I have a question specifically on the redevelopment of the Vancouver Art Gallery on the site that is now owned by the city, Uh, and I would ask um, Brent. Uh, Brent, given that a Vancouver Art Gallery uh, went ahead, uh, why, we, we understand now that when developments occur in the city, there are development cost charges and uh, community amenity charges. Uh, And a lot of this money goes into city coffers and it's used for various, um, it's used for various uh, programs, namely um, parks or uh, Mm -hmm. social housing or infrastructure, what have you. If the site is so valuable and the city is donating it to the Vancouver Art Gallery, Uh, Could you tell this audience uh, how large um, the gallery would be in terms of square footage? I've heard a number of about 300,000 square feet. But what is is to stop the city from uh, densifying the site to a 5, 6, 7, or 8, or even a 10 FSR, having the development community come in and build uh, towers, residential towers, where these funds would in turn be donated to the Vancouver Art Gallery. So that's question one. Okay, well, let's, you know what, because we're running out of time, we'll have to go with that question. An office tower is going to be built on that site, right? right? A a third of the site is not, uh, has not been given to the VAG. Uh, And there was the potential that the the feds might build on it, but that didn't uh, manifest. Uh, it's, um, it's still set aside as office, much-needed office space capacity. In the Metro Corps Jobs and Economy study we did, we found we needed 5.5 million square feet of office capacity over and above what we had to meet demand uh, for it's about, about 15 years now. So that's critically needed. If, if this were not a VAG site, this would not be a residential site uh, because the city needs it for commercial space, which is one of the ways to keep the expectation on the land down. Uh, but there is an irony to the way that we use our tools that if we did let it go for residential and used the, the, the community amenities uh, 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 math to fund uh, a vague uh, somewhere else, 
then that would, that would be a funding stream. Or there's even been discussions about residential towers on top of the VAG, which the VAG has not been interested in because it interferes with the iconic status of an object that they want to create. And I don't, I don't disagree with them on that. But uh, the, the challenge is the city can't use development charges for culture. The law sets out specifically what development charges can be spent on. For public benefits, you can negotiate anything, but the problem in our, in our I, I call it, uh, there's, there's only so much um, orange uh, juice in the orange, and the city is using that public benefits to pay for everything from parks to, to heritage preservation and restoration to there's pressure to use it for transit. Uh, and, of course, the, the mayor and council's number one priority is affordable housing. So an awful lot of that juice is going to pay for affordable housing right now. And so, isn't some of that money paying for the Queen Elizabeth Theatre renovations as well? It, it, yeah, there's a payback yeah. that's been built in, uh, uh, ironically, on that, yes. So we, we've even written, we being the city, have even written uh, unpaid checks. What's the, what's the metaphor? We, we, owe, we owe a debt already on that. So. There, there's no magic silver bullet from a funding perspective if we use that site for something else. Trust me, that we, we went through all those machinations to see if there was a magic trick that could be pulled off to, to, to create a funding source. Yeah, we, quickly, I, I agree. I mean, the Costco solution, like this Costco downtown, with the four towers going out of its head, um, no. Uh, we, as values as citizens, we need an institution called an art gallery, and it should have a good building and a prominent site. Uh, the net end of that argument would be to do, if you let it rip, all of downtown Vancouver and the inner ring would be residential towers, and all of our institutions, all our workspaces would be in, in the periphery, and that's foolishness, so we're not doing it. So we, we, we just can't let it rip, but you're right, that would be the thing. Yeah. We are uh, just about out of time, but can I quickly ask each of you to dream and tell me what, the, what a new Vancouver art gallery should be or what it should do for a city, this city? Who wants to go first? Grant, since you're the one who's really invested in this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, have, I would have to say, I guess my dreams would, would be focused on the programming that comes out of it. Um, I don't, you know, I, as I said before, I don't claim to be an authority on architecture. I, there's been museums that I think are interesting and others that aren't. Uh, for me, actually, I, when I go to places, I tend to focus on the inside spaces to see what they're like to actually work with. So my dream would be to have one that has a substantial level of program funding and operating funding so you can do things like expand uh, our programs that address uh, school kids and, uh, and build an audience and, and engage an audience in ways that um, one issue that one problem that many museums often have when they're submitting their budgets is they talk about heritage and that isn't necessarily what we say internally we're talking about criticality and building critical viewers so for me it would be um, the resources that would allow the institution to do that. And just to say that it's not something that uh, I, I'm self-centered on, I can remember my father asking me at one point when I was complaining about budget cuts, and he said, well, what does that mean for you? And I said, well, I'd have less work to do. So it would be uh, a level of funding that I would have a lot of work to do. So. I like that. Trevor, what, can you dream for a moment? Uh, I guess my dreams, uh, I've been the humanist today, uh, I, my hope for the gallery would be that it would catalyze a, dis, a discussion that we're not having. Uh, it's not really a money issue, and we've talked too much about money here today. The question is values. We have money for prison building boom, and we have money for a $3 billion new bridge to replace the Massey Tunnel, mm -hmm. utterly unneeded for any reason other to allow large ships full of oil to float by there. That's why it's being done. It has nothing to do with traffic. The, the, no, the, the Massey Tunnel reduces the depth of the ships that can pass by. So to have the export of oil needed by, by the people in power, we have to get rid of the tunnel to allow deeper things, and then we'll spend $3 million to build a new bridge to replace it. So it's not a money issue, and I'm hoping that the gallery... Uh, discussion. I hope it's successful. You know, I, I hope we get the money from all levels and the private sector to do it. But in the course of that, I hope we have a discussion about values. Because I think a lot of these, uh, the dots are not being connected in this city. Uh, uh, and we're misinterpreting motives and reasons for things. And that 
Massey uh, tunnel replacement is a perfect example. Andrew, can I ask you to dream? What will a new gallery look like do for the city? I'm going to close my eyes and have that sort of harpsichord dream sequence music. Could you, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Oh, this, you know, it's so weird with these headsets. I kind of feel like we're a boy band up here, too. It's pretty... Um, uh, You're the lead. Yeah, no. Um, you know, I, I think... I'm sort of thinking about the idea of civic responsibility and, and the, the public face of uh, a, a building, whatever that building is, wherever it is located. I think it has to reach out to the community. It has to contribute to the public realm. It can't be something that shuts itself off and turns inward. So it has to... It has to make for lively streets. Uh, it has to um, provide an opportunity or a place for people to gather. Uh, it, has to, um, it has to think not just about the culture inside the building, uh, the culture on the walls or in the performances taking place, but that sort of wonderful uh, synthesis of cultures that takes place outside, um, where people coming from all around the world, from all across the city, um, meet, mingle, gather, protest, who, who knows what, uh, and experience art in all its forms. Thank you for the dream sequence. And uh, you. you get the last word, Brent Chaudron. Uh, Trevor, Make and it I, short. Trevor and I agree that um, if, if it stands a chance of happening, it has to be the uh, result of a change in conversation, a focus on vision, values, and priorities. That's the only way it stands a chance. Uh, in terms of the, the design, the VAG has been doing all the right moves. Herzog and Demiren was the right firm both as designers, but also as fundraisers. And let's face it, the part of the reason they were chosen was you do a design and that becomes the basis of your fundraising. And sometimes you need a big name and you need a great design. So that's why they're doing it in the order that they're doing it. What that great design should be, ironically, we're the most designy panel that's talked the least about design in, in the, that I think we've ever done. In my first conversation with Kathleen Bartles six, seven years ago, um, I made the comment that I will still make today that we have a need. We are a city known for urbanism and urban design. We are not known for architecture. Uh, we need, I think, well, not need. Need is not the right word. We could strategically benefit from adventurous architecture in the right place. And this is one of those moments where anything but an adventurous piece of architecture would be a disappointment. But our value system, I always reinforce two things, green and urban. The basis of our success up to this point has been green and urban. So if you do, first of all, this should be the greenest uh, gallery ever built. Just like our convention center was recently, has been touted as the greenest convention center ever built. Uh, that should be part of the mindset. And it, they'll be battling against some Renzo Piano buildings out there uh, as galleries. Urban, uh, what that means is uh, it should contribute to the street around it. It should create a public space like the Oslo Opera House does. It should create a, an edge that's urban like the Musée de Beaux-Arts does in, in Montreal. It should not be a lazy art object in space like Gary does, like Liebskin does, like Rem Koolhaas does, etc. Uh, it should contribute to its urban experience. The best thing that Gary Rahm does, uh, uh, not Rahm, A-G-O, is when you're inside it, it reveals the city. You actually see views and perspectives of the city that you've never perceived before. Our convention center does that too. So the building contributes to the city around it. That's what I mean by urban. So you get your green, you get your urban, and that includes placemaking and a creation of, of great public spaces. Uh, then you get permission to do something adventurous. Too many buildings out there do adventurous at the expense of urban. And that, that's something that just doesn't fit our value system in Vancouver. That's a great way to end. I, I want to thank you, the audience, for great questions and comments and for spending a sunny Friday afternoon here talking about something that is, I think, crucial for the future of the city and uh, the future of our artists and the experience of living here for people who work in the healthcare sector in every sector. So thank you. And thank you so much to the panelists, Trevor Bodie. Excuse me, Grant Arnold, uh, Andrew pa ta Pasker, uh. and Brent, Brent Totterin, and thanks to the Spur Festival, who apparently they're going to thank us now, too. All right, go ahead. And thank you to Marcia Lederman for rounding that conversation. That was great, too.